I understand the purpose of our session this afternoon is to, uh, to talk about voice in a more objective way since all of you are caller coaches. And as a result of being caller coaches, you not only try to help them to understand how to choreograph and how to manage crowds, but you try to help them to, to modulate their voices in such a way so that their commands are easily audible and their, um, their voices uh, are in pitch and that they don't get vocally tired. So before you folks came in, I was uh, conversing here with these guys and wondering um, if there were any things in particular that were of interest to talk about, <coughs> and there didn't seem to be. Do you, have, do you bring anything that's of particular concern to yourselves? I think that's really important. Would you kind of summarize that one more time, because it should have been on tape. Oh, sure. Yeah, Vic Curry. Um, what I'm looking out of getting this out of this session is, being a caller coach, being a, a teacher, what's a 30-minute to 15-minute spiel that I can tell them about their vo voice that would benefit them the most? You remember that we spent 90 minutes this morning, and we just talked about range extension, and we talked about uh, quality change. And, and so it really wasn't conceivable for – could I have done that in fewer moments? Yeah, I think I could have, and I'm going to try to give you some real shortcuts. Before we get too far gone, I'd like to introduce my wife who's able to be with us. This is my wife, Lorraine. She's had not normally been able to join us in the past, and it's close enough to our home that I was able to pry her away from her teaching so that she could come down. I'm glad to have her here. <clears throat> so there are four things that a singer needs to be able to do with his or her voice. The first one is to make a healthy sound. And usually a healthy sound is a pleasant sound. And so when you hear a voice that is by degree um, unattractive, harsh, uh, pinched, uh, when you hear somebody whose voice is not pleasant to listen to, you can almost be sure that they're doing something pathological with their voice. The problem is to figure out what, how to, how to diagnose that issue. Uh, and sometimes uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a guessing game, just like when you go to the doctor and you present with a certain number of symptoms, and, and it could be this disease or it could be that infirmity. And the doctor doesn't really know for sure, but he guesses for the, the best option, gives you medicine for the best, most likely option. You take that medicine, you don't get well. Then that means that he goes to option number two and gives you the medicine and and you, you, you just go through that trial and error because there is so much about life that is unpredictable and unknown. Even, uh, you know, we, we think we know a lot about medicine, but in many respects we don't know very much. So in singing, there are four tasks that a singer needs to be able to do. The first being to make a healthy sound. The second is to inflect that healthy sound upwards and downwards to create a variety in speech and also an inflection that uh, makes a melody in, in singing. When you start making a melody, then you have to be very specific about what pitch you're matching. It can't be just generally in the up direction. It has to be specifically to a, cer a certain pitch that uh, is in harmony with the music or down. And, and that, that's a heightened level of uh, inflection that becomes kind of precise. <clears throat> The third thing that a singer needs to be able to do is to uh, go loud and soft. And the fourth thing that a singer needs to do is to be able to take his quality and uh, change it around to be able to uh, get different inflections in the voice so that a, a voice can be kind, it can be commanding, it can be inviting, it can be punishing or judgmental. And we do that in our speaking voices at will. We can change the, the subtle qualities of our voice in nonverbal ways, in the non-word kind of ways, to imply many, many different meanings. And the more adept a singer is at adapting the quality of his or her voice, the more variety of music he or she can be successful in singing. So those four tasks. So if you're trying to find a, short, a shorthand, they need to be able to make a healthy sound, they need to be able to inflect that sound up and down, make it loud and soft, and change the inflection of it in terms of the, the, uh, in, uh, the quality. 
So let's start quickly. I spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, uh, range extension and flexion, and I'm going to invite you all to receive a little gift from me. Everyone knows that we're here this morning. Got one already. I got one more. And this is a this is a great tool. You can for for um, for four dollars. I got this box of a thousand straws at Staples, and that. It's a really cheap investment, but if you're looking for a way to help a voice to produce itself healthily, you want to have it based upon uh, air flow, not on air compression. Unfortunately, the vast majority of people in our culture use compression as the way, the way that they make their voice to work. And when I say compression, here's what I mean specifically. They take the, the muscles that control their vocal folds and they tense them. Then that makes them somewhat stiff, and then against that resistance, they apply a significant amount of breath energy, breath pressure. What, what results from that sound, uh, that production, is a penetrating, uh, commanding, irritating, tiring, uh, bright, tight quality. And that's if you were to if you start listening to. Uh, square dance callers, you'll hear that pattern much more frequently than you'll hear the mellow, easy, natural quality. Just a quick question about that, and we, I know it's going to come up what we talked about this morning. Um, one of the reasons I started square dance calling is because of when I started, the CBs were the thing, and I had what was called a CB voice, which meant I had that, you know, that stressful voice that cuts through all the hash and trash. And a lot of times we as callers have to use that because of a sound acoustics and we can't use the pleasant voice. Are you going to address that when to and when not to? The interesting thing is that all of the sounds that all of the positive qualities of, a, of an unhealthy production, the presence, the domination, the penetration power, can be produced acoustically without any muscle strain. So you can get all of the positive qualities from it without the negative associations with it. And so when we talk about voice quality, we'll come to that again. If you'll all take your straws, we'll just take a moment. You want to grab a couple of new ones? Well, she lost hers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, the, uh, would you like one, Lorraine? <laughs> I'm actually going to use Lorraine to demonstrate. She doesn't know that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, yeah they, they, would you return them and I'll recycle them? <laughs> so if you'll just put the straw in your mouth and um, make a sound through it, you'll immediately start to discover something unique about it. The first is that it takes some effort to make very much sound. And so in many respects, we work too hard. If you can get to the point where you can go, and calibrate the amount of pressure that it takes for the air to flow easily and still make a vocal sound, that's a, that's a balanced equilibrium. Most people will go, because they're used to having to fight through the obstruction in their throat, and they'll overproduce their voices. Overproduction always leads to vocal weariness. Uh, this is particularly true for, voice te uh, for school teachers who are seeking to kind of control the crowd, if you will, but if you can just find that equilibrium, and you can find it very readily by just going, bah, bah, blow on this thing until the amount of pressure is not overwhelming, okay? Just, bah, 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 bah. and you'll find that the sound that results is very easy on your throat. And it's a remarkably noisy sound for the amount of energy that you're, you're giving to it. It's at the same time a rather warm, inviting kind of a sound. It has no stridency because it has no tension in it. This is called positive pre pressure phonation or flow phonation. And it is that because when you put the straw in your mouth and, and phonate through it, it builds up pressure. You can feel it all the way down to the bottom of your trachea. 
And in that environment, your vocal folds are inclined to adopt a more passive environment, a passive response, and they vibrate very spontaneously and naturally. It takes the tension out of your vocal folds is the simplest way to say it. So that's already too many words to be able to fit into a 15-minute um, ex explanation, but the first thing is to make a healthy sound. That's not the only way that it can be done. In the last session, we explored the possibility of uh, finding uh, uh, the threshold of efficiency, and I'll very quickly review that. You get a person to start in a very gentle, sighing sound, ah, ah, the kind of sound that they would never, ever use if they were going to be calling a dance. But you get them to describe the sensation of what that feels like, and they will say things like, it's breathy, it feels loose, it feels flowing, I can feel the air leaking out of my throat. They'll say something like that. It's an inefficient quality. Then I'll ask them to remember that sensation of release in their throat and then take them to the step two, which is to imagine a pinwheel on the tip of their fingers. You might even want to go to a toy store and purchase a pinwheel and have them blow on it gently. The, the pinwheel will move gently. Have them blow with greater intensity, and the pinwheel will pick up speed, and you draw their attention to the fact that that's what their body does to increase airflow. And if they start with that gentle sound, ah, and don't do anything to change their throat, but change the speed of their breath, the sound will immediately evolve into that healthy sound, like this. Ah, and right there is the point of efficiency. How do I know where it is? Because there's no more leakage of breath. It turns completely to sound. Listen again, and you'll hear it happen. And you can hear this as it relates to your own dancers, your own callers, as they're trying to go to school. If you hear this kind of a sound, can you hear the little white noise in the background? There's voice, but there's some white noise. Right, there's no, there's no more white noise. And that's when, when you know that they've hit that threshold. They'll know that they've hit that threshold because all of a sudden there's no wastage uh, of their, their breath. And secondarily, they begin to feel all of the resonance chambers in their mouth and in the back of their throat and down into their throat fill up with sound because the sound is now efficient in its production. And if you can help somebody to find that threshold, whether you use a straw or use that means, it's great. Another common way to do it is to go shh, 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 shh. You saw what I just did, right? I was a voiceless sound. Then I made the fricative sound, the sibilant sound with the voice involved, and that made it to a Z-H sound. Shh, 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 shh. And that's another way that you can do it, where you start the breath through a consonant sound, a continuing consonant and you teach them this gentle start. Okay, that's, that's a, one way to do it. Here's the, perhaps the very most efficient way to do it, and it's the thing that we did at the last of the last session, and that is to cry like a baby. When a baby is born, it uses its voice more efficiently than it will ever use it again in its life. It's hardwired to do it because it's a survival technique, and the baby's sound sounds something like this. Wah! Of course, that baby's already come out with, with teeth and a beard, but, <laughs> but it's that same pattern, and it's a pattern that each one of us and all of your callers was born with. We've long since sort of forgotten it, moved away from it, supplanted it with something else, but refinding that pattern is a perfect way to help discover the ease of production. So when I do that baby cry, you listen and see if you can figure out what's going on. Now, would each one of you try that yourselves? <laughs> Jeanette looks really puzzled. Jeanette, you were born, weren't you? <laughs> you were born. <laughs> no, you, uh, sometimes... Uh, Every time when I teach uh, uh, um, college-level singers and I show them this to them, there's this moment that of look like just like Jeanette had on her face, which was to say, "What is? 
I'm coming to college to cry like, what is this all about? I don't remember. I'm so self-conscious. What does a baby cry like? And then, of course, anybody that's had a small baby recently or been around a small baby says, oh, I know what that sounds like. It's really, really an intense sound. So would you try it again? It need not be the pitch that I just introduced to you. It will be your own unique pitch. But it will have the same characteristics, and you just have to go back to that newborn sense and let your body show you what it's supposed to do. Try it again, please. Wah. Okay, I'm going to turn to John because I heard John do something right. John, what was the first characteristic that leapt out as you as you did the baby cry? The first characteristic? Um, try, trying to channel my son, I think. But um, um, it, it seems it seemed to me the sound was more forward. Is that... I, I, that, that's what that's what it got to me. Yeah, it came across very forward, so forward that it felt like it was in your nose, and that's the first characteristic that people think. I don't want to sing in my nose. That's not right. But the truth is, it isn't in your nose. When you do the baby cry properly, a second thing happens quite spontaneously, not because you tell it to, but because you're hardwired to do it, and that is your soft palate rises and closes off the nasal ports so that any sound that would be shunted up into the nose is blocked from doing so and redirected into the mouth onto the hard palate where the projection happens. And a baby does that hardwired. They don't know they're doing it. That's just what you do when you're going to project your voice. So you get, Wah! and it feels like it's right in your nose, but it's not. Listen, Wah! 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 If, it were, if my soft palate's down, here's what you get. Wah! Wah! You get that kind of honking sound in your nose when your soft palate is down and relaxed. In a baby's cry, the soft palate automatically goes up. I must parenthetically say that there are voice teachers who build their whole teaching methodology on raising the soft palate because they know that that's a characteristic that's important. But it's only one of several, and, but there is a group of voice teachers who make their whole teaching method on keeping your soft palate high. Why do they make such an issue out of it? Because American English is very lazy and has a low soft palate, and uh, most Americans speak with dark vowels and sounds shunted up into the nose. As a result of that, we have a kind of a honking quality to our speech patterns that uh, others don't have. Jeanette, of course, is Swiss, but she, you don't have that characteristic in your language. No, that is, no, it's not so much a problem that German speakers have at all. No nasal consonants, uh, no nasal vowels in German. Uh, the French have a little more trouble with it, but, but Americans have a serious problem with it. We, we're lazy in our soft palates. But the baby cry induces that behavior to close the nasal port. As a result, the sound that comes out feels strangely to us, very much in the nose, not where we expect it to vibrate. That raised palate really does a good thing. So do it again, and I'll point out the next thing that's of significance. Wah, 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 wah. You'll notice that always it starts gently. It either starts with your mouth closed, wah, wah, it was what a baby does, or as an adult you can make a W, wah, wah, and either one of them is good because either the closed mouth position or the, the pursed lips position will induce the vocal folds to begin their vibration patterns gently. Unlike, ah, 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 which is very percussive and very damaging to the throat. Wah, wah. You can hear it happening, right? So as soon as the baby senses the gentility of the start, it leaves the, the, the gentle place and goes to the nastiest vowel in the language, ah, to, to give the projection to it. Okay, so that's the, 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 the next thing along the way as you do it. Watch what happens to your breathing system. Try it. Wah, 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 wah. Every time you make that, that sound, there's a gesture in your breathing that's totally spontaneous. 
and it almost doesn't really reveal itself in the moment of the start. It reveals itself more at the moment when you finish and you realize that you've been doing something. It's very spontaneous. It doesn't have to be trained. Let me say that again. It doesn't have to be trained. It's spontaneous. However, we've forgotten it, and so we learn things to do with our breathing that somehow get in the way of it. Um, let me just uh, pause parenthetically and, and talk a little bit about air pressure. It's measured in, a, in a Pascal's. Pascal is a scientist from the 17th century, a Frenchman, who uh, started developing a formula for air pressure. And I don't remember the exact uh, uh, formula for measuring a Pascal, a single Pascal, but the, the book that I was reading a, a bit ago said that from the gentlest speech that a human makes to the most aggressive uh, speech that a, a human makes, you go from point of about three one hundredths of a Pascal for a gentle whisper, to 3,000 pascals. So there's quite a range. For an opera singer, they, uh, they generate upwards of 6,000 pascals of, of air pressure. But here's the significant in information. The pulmonary system has the capability of generating upwards of 10,000 pascals. What that means is that the breath system can overdrive the sound-producing system significantly by, again, half. And that's a common occurrence where the, the breath system drives the voice rather than being in equilibrium. And one of the things that you learn from the baby cry is that it just spontaneously, it calls forth the amount of breath necessary to do the job. Unless you forget what we were talking about. We're talking about how to get to simple and basic phonation, right? That's a lot of other parenthetical stuff. But the last thing that I want to draw attention to is what happens here in your throat. So will you do the baby cry again and watch what happens as you do, do it? Wah, 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 wah. Let's see, Bob. Bob, what does your throat feel like when you do that? Well, um, I've been singing for a while, so it, it didn't bother my throat at all. Good. Uh, let's see. What have you got to say? No, it felt relaxed. Yes. Um, I, I was hoping for another word. <laughs> It, it, it has, it sounds like, it has this many, no, never mind. No, the truth of the matter is it feels open. It, it, if, if I were to create a hand gesture, it would go like this. At the moment that you make the sound, it feels like it releases or it opens. That's correct. Now, quack like a duck. Quack, quack, quack. Can you feel the compression going on right there? Now do the baby cry. Quack. You see how there's a great release? And so that's, that's actually where I'm going with this thing, is that when you're trying to get a, an efficient sound production, maybe the fastest way to do it is the baby cry because it induces the patterns that are necessary for healthy sound. The breath support is spontaneous and proportional to the demand. The, the throat is always released. The soft palate is always up, and as a consequence, the sound is always forward. Those are really significant things it's, uh, in terms of ease of sound production. So whether you use the straw, whether you use the threshold exercise with the pinwheel, whether you use um, uh, SH or Z or whatever to get the consonants that get the sound to start and then open to the vowel, or you use the baby cry, they're all tools that can be used to uh, induce healthy production. How do you know when this production is not healthy? Let me offer some suggestions. The qualities of sounds that are destructive are pressed, pinched, often the same thing, and they are characterized by being very bright, tight, somewhat brittle qualities. People who use this will often find themselves with their voice breaking, cracking. Uh, the other, on the other end of the extreme is the diffused or the breathy or the, or the unenergized voice sound. And then every once in a while you'll get sort of a gravelly quality voice that is a mix of uh, unhealthy production, a lot of compression, and then some use of the false vocal folds that grinds the voice. It makes a noisy or a raspy, harsh quality. Those are the characteristics that you're going to want to try to talk people out of because 
to do them, they have to do things that are damaging to their voices. They've done it for years, and so they don't see it as a, as a pathology. But the longer you do it, the more it starts to show up. The longer the dance is that you have to call, the quicker your voice tires. The more dances you have to call in the week, the sooner in the week your voice gets tired. The more years you do it, the sooner comes the point where you say, it's too hard, I don't want to do it anymore. So you want to find a, a degree of efficiency, and if you can help your people do that, they will be happy. Now, of those varieties of different approaches that I suggested to you, which ones seem to make the most immediate sense to you? Does anybody care? The baby cry, the thresholds, the approach, the use of the straw. Which ones seem to be the most spontaneous in terms of inducing healthy production? Because what you're trying to do is to find a shortened script that will help you get your callers to that place. You can't afford to take as much time to explain as I took because you've got too many other things to do. So, Jerry, the straw was very useful to you. That very much measures the flow of breath. It forces them to have to account for the, the flow of breath. Tim. Yeah, I like the, uh, the difference between the, uh, uh, the duck and the baby. Very quickly, very quickly, you could hear it, but you could feel it too, couldn't you? So if you get quack, quack, that's that tight, brittle sound that has no air through it and a lot of muscular compression, whereas the baby cry is quite the opposite of that. So people, given a choice of contrasts, they can tell the difference between them and they'll elect the one and not the other. If they don't know, if they don't know how to choose, if they don't have the discretionary ability. So it might be useful to have a couple of approaches so that if one doesn't work, the other one can help. But that's the single most important thing that you can do to help your callers to be successful, is to help them to produce their voice healthily. <clears throat> the next thing that needs to happen for them is that they need to be able to inflect their voices upwards and downwards. That can be done again with the use of the straw. In the last session, we talked about ways to use the straw to induce imp improved um, inflection. So I won't take too much time. Some of you are here. Those of that you weren't can maybe listen to the tape, but I'll quickly summarize it. If you get the, the movement of breath through the straw, the vocal folds will pacify. They will not be so stiff. In their more relaxed state, they will change their shape more readily than when they're stiff and tight. Um, and, and that's going to be very significant. Oh, you need one, don't you? <clears throat> so I want you to put the straw in your mouth, and I want you to, without changing pressure, this is the important part, without changing pressure, uh, go upwards in your scale. You can tell if you change pressure because you'll put your hand in front of the straw, and if, the, if you feel the straw diminish in speed of air, if there's not, not as much air, then you're muscularly you're starting to compress and not let the air flow through. Try it. When I do that, there's a flip in, my, in the quality of my voice. I go from a, a heavier voice to a lighter voice. And most men are fearful of that lighter voice for fear that that's their falsetto. It isn't at all. It's just a different change in the shape of the vocal folds from short and thick to long and thin. And, and people have to learn how to negotiate that. Part of the reason why people are limited in their, their singing range is because they're fearful of that transition. They don't know how to do it. And so the, the use of a straw to create uh, slides and sirens as they learn to do that, their, their voices will become increasingly supple. You can even get them to sing the song that they're going to sing, call the, the call that they're going to do with the straw in their mouth. They don't get the words. They get, they're just learning how to inflect their voices upwards and downwards. So the straw has, again, a secondary value in terms of in, inducing improved patterns uh, up and down. So if I go, you can hear me flip it, right? Can you hear that register flip? I'll get into that upper register. That's the range that men are afraid of for fear that it's going to sound like falsetto. 
but listen to it. When I, when I take the straw out, I'll just set the pattern in motion, take the straw out, open my mouth, and watch what comes out. That's not falsetto. That's a lighter voice. It's that alternating quality of voice. And men are afraid of that quality because it sounds like their child. It re it's reminiscent of their child voice. And they're, they, they don't know how to deal with it. On the converse side, women often are, are wishing for more depth in their voice. And they speak more in this, that voice right in there. That's kind of the, the range that women normally speak in. But they're uncomfortable to do this. And that flip over to them is as disconcerting in most cases as it is in reverse for the man. So you hear this, and you think, wow, that was so easy to do with the straw in there. And I took my, my, the straw out and opened up my mouth, and it was this rich, full, vibrant sound, and you didn't have to do anything. And you didn't have to do anything to induce that. And to prove that that's so, I'm going to ask Jeanette come up to do that. So you're going to start high, glide low, and then when you're low, take the straw out of your mouth and just sing whatever comes to your mind. But you have to do it on a microphone. See, that's easy. Now, that wasn't really a, that wasn't a fair a test because Jeanette's comfortable in that range. So who isn't comfortable in her range that way? Ah, all right. Okay, so that can be a useful tool. There are some, a minority of men, maybe 10% of men, who speak in that higher quality, and they have a hard time finding the bottom side of their voice. Many women have a hard time finding the bottom side of their voice. And they'll go... And then they'll, they'll start to press and, and squeeze as trying to force something out rather than just letting it flow out. Okay, so that's one quick way. If you go back to the baby cry, there is a, a much that you can discover about how easy it is to inflect your voice. So I'm going to demonstrate, and then I'm going to ask you to do it. <clears throat> Or, that's a wide range. That's much wider range than you'll ever use. And the interesting thing is, is that because of this little pattern of release in the throat that we discovered a few moments ago, when the vocal folds get pacified, when they become relaxed, they can, they can stretch in all kinds of unusual ways that, that when they stay partially stiff, you can't go there. Now it's your turn. Join with me, would you? So you start the baby cry and then inflect upwards. Go to your own boundaries. Remember that as you go higher, you don't add pressure. You just follow the pattern. What's the pattern? Forward in the nose, lifted roof of the mouth, spontaneous breath on demand, and release in the throat. That's it. It's a pretty easy pattern to remember. Here we go. Oh, come on. I won. <laughs> you can do that again. <laughs> Let's try. You guys are just a little too... Uh, Inhibited, <laughs> experimental. So just let it go. Go. <laughs> Way up in there is where you can go. <laughs> if you have a mind to want to do that. I'm sure that somebody could find a call where they could use that sound and, and get it to good effect. Go the opposite direction. Okay, so when you go low, incidentally, this pitch inflection is something that a baby cannot do. 
A, ba a baby's voice is not fully developed when it's born. And one of the things that the baby can't do is inflect its pitch upwards and down. If you, if you listen to a baby cry, it's always the same frequency. And over the course of several months, six or seven or eight months, it'll start to play with pitch. And its ability to play with pitch has to do with the development of the ligament on the inside edge of the vocal fold, which is, gives it its stretchability. And, and so they start to play with pitch inflection as they get that. And we already have that. So we can, we can go on beyond. But most people don't follow the bad pattern of the baby cry when they go low. They will go this way. Wah, 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 wah. But if I go wah, 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 it sounds like a cow lowing, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like a human sound, but it's still that same wah. It's a baby cry. Wah, wah. That's, that's the range that you can play. And you can learn to play that game. And your dancers can, too. How do you transition from the raw exercise? Will you get them to <laughs> – everybody will get a good chuckle out of this. Anyway, you get them to baby cry every note in the song that they sing. And somehow about it, there's just a spontaneous – leftover memory of the simplicity of that that allows them to bridge past the anxieties of those changes in registers. So that gives you a way where you can very quickly and spontaneously lead them to pitch inflection. You can do it with this. Or with the baby cry, both of them are really useful for helping people get uh, a pitch inflection. Now comes loud and soft. How, how important is loud and soft for you all? Or do you manage it with the volume control? It's important. It's yeah. in singing. Well, yeah. Yes. I'm not talking about color per se, the timbre of the voice per se, although you really can't separate them. Now, how do you get them to go loud and soft? Let me see. Uh, whom have I? Uh, Vic, come on up for a second, will you? So this is one of the ways that you can help people to sing. Can you take just a phrase of a singing call? Do you have something in your mind that you could use? Okay. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Okay, would you sing that phrase for me? Jumping Jack Flash, it's a gas, gas, gas. Now choose one that you have to sing. Oh, come on. Um, what a beautiful noise. Be Such noise. a beautiful sound. Okay. So now, the first thing that I'm going to get you to do is to do that on threshold. So take your straw. You'll see it, how this will transition very quickly. Go ahead. In here, right? You'll notice that he has very, very intermittent airflow. That's the reason it sort of seems to congest itself. Now do it in such a way so that you can keep. There are changes. There are empty spots in between. Now can you do it in such a way so that there's no interruption from one note to the next? Sure. Same breath pressure. He's actually uh, involved in making pitch change by changing subglottic pressure, and it has to recalibrate itself for each new note. Whereas if you don't do that, ooh, ooh, I'm not sure what the melody is after that. Okay, now start that and then pull the straw out. So you're, you're going and then move that into the... And say words or just... Little noise, got a beautiful sound. Now you hear the rasp that's in the, in the sound. That's an absence of airflow. So if okay. you were to think of the pinwheel moving faster and sing the same way, let's see what happens. With or without? Without. What a beautiful noise, such a beautiful sound. Already that's a step in the right direction. But if we, can you take what a beautiful and take that note right there? What? 
Go ahead. What a beautiful noise. Beautiful. You changed ever so slightly. You didn't change very much inside, but the quality did. Try it again. What a beautiful. What a beautiful noise. Such a beautiful sound. Yep, keep going. Coming in through my window, we don't have to know words. <laughs> Alaman left and we. All right. So now do the same thing. You can see the process of going from inefficient formation to slightly more efficient formation by just asking him to find the threshold based on that exercise. Now, baby, cry that. Wah, 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 wah. Wah, 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 wah. Really, wah, wah, wah. Wow, 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 Okay, now do that again with the baby cry, and then immediately turn around and sing it with the words in the pattern of the baby cry. How? What's the pattern of the baby cry? Forward in the mass. That's a challenge for him. Soft palate up. That's a challenge. Release in the throat. That's a challenge. Spontaneous breath. Hmm, you got some challenges. I do. Wow, 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 wow. Sorry. Was that good or bad? Gotcha. Nice. Wow, 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 wow. 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 All right. You had a hard time holding it into the bridge of your nose. I did. So this time... The baby cry has wah in it all the time. Okay. You do that? Same thing? Yep. Wah, 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 wah. 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 Now sing the words in that pattern. What a beautiful noise. Such a beautiful sound. Alaman left do something else. Okay. All right. So in that process, there are several ways that you can go about trying to work on pitch inflection, one of which is having the flow of breath through the straw, the other one being the baby cry that can help with the pitch inflection. And you saw, you saw how self-conscious you felt. That was really awkward, wasn't it? Totally. Yeah. But as you got over that, you know, momentarily, there were moments where you were very successful at doing that, and your wife now nods your head, and so you're not going to be able to get away with the other anymore. Nice. But the other thing is true for, the, for when you're working with a caller. You can point that out. You can give them an assignment. You can send them away and, and say, don't come back singing that call until you can consistently do it with the straw in your mouth and keep the sound, the pressure on your hand the same. Or go away. Do it with a baby cry until you can keep the baby cry consistent. What's the pattern of the baby cry? Forward in the mask, lifted soft palate, released throat, spontaneous breath. That's about as simple as you can make it. Those are simple things that somebody can do. And the interesting thing about it is that when you find that threshold, you know what it feels like. When you find the, the pattern of the baby cry, it, it, it reveals itself spontaneously, not just to the listener, but to the person who does it. There's some self-monitoring that's available to them. Okay, now we come to loud and soft. Uh, Tim, would you be the guinea pig for this one? Sure. Come on up. You got another uh, singing call that you could use as a, you know, a phrase or two of it? Uh, yeah, but I don't know which one. Somebody give me, give me a name. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, hello, Mary Lou. <laughs> Put a dream in the pocket. Either way. Put a dream in your pocket, a song in your voice. Swing with that girl, promenade her, go around. That sounds like what a beautiful world. Yeah, that beautiful noise. Yeah, that was a beautiful noise. Hello, Mary Lou. Goodbye, heart. Sweet Mary Lou, I'm so in love with you. Now, what's, what's really successful, Tim has that baby cry pattern in his voice already. One of the things that makes it so easy to move up and down is that baby cry. 
He has it placed in the place that the baby crying normally would be. So he's a child at heart, I guess. <laughs> Childish. Now, the next thing I'm going to ask you to do. No, don't go. No, I don't want to back. You got it for a while. I want you to sing the, that same thing again as loud as you possibly can with one boundary only. And that is you're in balance with yourself right now. Your voice is balanced pretty good. Sing it as loud as you can and still stay in balance. So what hap often happens when people start singing louder is that they oversing themselves. One part of their system starts to override the other mm -hmm. system. And you can tell when it happens. You can tell when, the, when it happens because something in the body gets stiff and locked up. The breathing gets locked up. The jaw gets locked up. The back of the neck gets tight. The tongue gets tight. They can tell. You can tell. And when you, you, so you go right up to the point where you're going to lose balance, and that's as loud as you can go for now. So, for example, you can scream at a basketball game, and that's 100% uh, vocal energy, but you can't do it very long, and you lose your voice. So go as loud as you possibly can and still stay in balance with yourself. Okay. Hello, Mary Lou. Goodbye, heart, sweet Mary Lou. I'm so in love with you. Good. Well, okay. now do exactly the same thing as quietly as you possibly can. And okay. still stay in balance. How will he know when he drops out of balance? His voice will turn breathy or it will turn tight. Okay. He'll get stiff. He'll get locked up. Same pattern on the bottom here. Quiet. Well, he hello, hello, hello. Well, hello, Mary Lou. Goodbye, heart, sweet Mary Lou. I'm so in love with you. All right. <laughs> now, thanks very much, Tim. I've got a question. Don't go away yet. You're done. You're going to You did get softer. You did. So, so if screaming is 100% vocal energy, what, what percentage of energy did you give when you were singing your loudest? By comparison. Say that again. If screaming is 100% vocal energy and it's got some strain in it, right. uh, what percentage was that the loudest that you just sang? At, at the soft tones. The loudest. The loudest. At the loudest. Yeah, the loudest. If screaming is 100%, what percent was that loud singing? 100%. Not quite, because it, it didn't lose balance with itself. Oh, it didn't, I didn't lose balance, so I had oh, to be at 90%. Yeah, you, you, you didn't overdrive yourself. You're somewhere in the 80-ish range oh, or I so, I would guess. You could there about, I could get louder. But it would start to strain your voice. Right. Yeah, so somewhere in the round of 80-ish or so. So if whispering is 10% vocal energy, what was the quiet? What was the percentage on the quiet? It seemed 10%. It was more, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, 25, 30, somewhere in that range, right? Yeah, definitely yeah. more. Yeah. yeah, so go ahead and have a seat. Now, okay. if you look at music, it's, it's listed as having forte, F for loud, piano, P for piano, mezzo piano is medium soft, medium loud, double forte is really loud, double piano is really quiet, and you can play that. Tim can play that game right now. If you ascribe 80% as being double loud and 70 as being loud and 60 as being medium loud and 50 as being medium quiet and 40 being quiet and 30 being double quiet, pianissimo, you've got all of those ranges that you can play with, louds and softs, right now. And every one of you does, too. Every one of you has the, has the ability to go somewhere between 70 to 80 percent and 30 to 40 percent on the other end and still stay in balance with yourselves. But we rarely allow, our, allow ourselves to do that, and we ought to do it a whole lot more. And it's so easy. You just say degree of, of intensity. So if I were to, as a matter of fact, we'll do it. No, I don't know. We'll take the time because we're trying to be efficient about this. But if you were to see, no, you all need something to do. So what, what song should we sing? Should we sing... Uh, Coming around the mountain? Or? Hello, Mary Lou. Everybody know the words on that, the, the regular words? Okay, so I want you to all start out at about 50%. Hello. We're going to take that pitch, all right? 50%, go. Hello. 60. Seventy. Okay.
Good. Now, start at 50 again. Hello. Mary Lou. 60. Goodbye, 70. 40. 30. 50. 80. All right, so right off the bat, without any hardship at all, you could calibrate yourselves. I call the percentage to it. The nice thing about it is that it's calibrated based upon each of your own skills. So your neighbor may be able, their 80% may be more than your 80%. It doesn't matter if their 30% may be less than your 30%. You know, they're, they're, so whatever you do as a singer, you go to the boundaries of what you can accomplish, and you just keep hanging out at the frontiers. You keep pushing the frontiers towards louder and louder and softer and softer. And pretty soon, you've got yourself a whole range of dynamics. But there's something else that's really significant, and I don't know that you picked up on it again. So will you sing Mary Lou one more time? Because we're talking about quality of sound as well. So let's start off at 50. Go. Seventy. Forty. All right. That's, did you see what you just did? You went up to the highest part of the song, quiet. Why did you do that? Because you stayed in balance with yourselves. Most people will blast away on the high notes. They fall out of balance with themselves. That's parenthetical. Here's what I really wanted to say. And that is that all of those different dynamics elicited different qualities of sound in your voice. And so if you're looking for a palette of colors from which to paint the sounds of your voice, when you go toward the loud sounds, it's almost like taking solid colored crayons and drawing with solid colors. When you go toward the quiet side, it's like using pastels, shades. So when you start at this this level, and you go louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and softer and softer and softer. There's a dynamic change, but there's a color, a quality change as well. So if you're wanting to help your, your uh, singers to gain a variety of inflections in their voice, this game right here can help them play it really, really well. Just say, don't always sing at 70%. Sing at 40% sometimes. And... You, the 40% 40, 40 will bring the sweet, gentle into their voice. The 70 will make the, the aggressive sounds. You start intermingling those things together, and pretty soon they're able to cover a whole wide range of inflection qualities without doing any damage to their throat. Most singers, when they see a forte in the music, they just blast away. It's beyond what I can do, so I sing as loud as I can, and they don't do it in balance. Quiet, they throttle it down until it doesn't work anymore. Well, you just grade it all the way through the process. Okay, we're going to come back to the baby cry now, because the baby cry can also help a very, very much to change not only ups and downs, but it can change louds and softs. So if you start off, it got louder and louder, right? It did another thing, too. Did you tell what it was? <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. And um, that's normal. You know, we've, we've talked about how when in pitch flexion you can either stretch the vocal ligament and the pitch will go up or you can add subglottic pressure. Well, guess what I did? I added subglottic pressure because I was trying to get louder, but the vocal folds weren't stiff and fighting it, and so they just went right on up in pitch. Thank you very much. So it's not like that system is entirely bad, but the hard challenge is this, to hold the steady pitch and get louder and get louder and softer. So you go, wah, 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 wah. But the way you do it is to maintain the pattern of the baby cry. What's that? The, and this is mostly the breath. If the breath overdrives the system, it'll collapse. But if it is spontaneous in its delivery, and if it will be um, proportional to what you're asking from it, it'll deliver it. Now, how do you get louder? It's not one thing or another. You get more breath energy, more resistance in the vocal folds. The vocal folds get a little stiffer, not destructively so, but a little stiffer. And the resonance spaces 
open up. You'll see people singing loud, and their mouths will be wide open. They're singing soft, and their mouths are kind of closed. And so those three things kept in balance will get a voice louder and get a voice softer. If you watch me, watch as I go through this again. Wah, 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 wah. You see what's happening with my mouth as I get louder? Wah, 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 wah. So it isn't just one system overdriving the rest. It's all three of the systems staying in balance. You try with me. We'll choose about this pitch. Start gentle. Wah. Remember the pattern there, 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 and there. Yeah. And you'll be amazed. You can go quieter than you would have thought that you could. You can go louder than you would have thought you could. And the nice thing about going loud this way is it never becomes harsh. It never be, because it doesn't get harsh because it doesn't get stiff. It's the stiffness that caused stridency that, to come into the human voice. Okay, so we've now talked about basic sound production. You notice that I'm keeping them pretty close and uh, using the same tools again and again to apply to different things. And I'm doing that on purpose so that if you're trying to find a, a vocabulary or a script or a pattern to share with your dancers, you don't bury them in a blizzard of stuff, you give them a couple of simple things that can be done to help. Changing the quality of the voice is pretty significant. And it's most readily done by reshaping vowels. I'm going to come back to the baby cry again and ask, let's see, uh, Bob, would you be my guinea pig this time? Would you come on up? I want you to know that once I learned about this baby cry, my wife, has, she thought she had grown all of her children. <laughs> and now she's found that the biggest baby of all is still at home. <laughs> I want you to use the baby cry, but uh, I want you to then use the pattern of the baby cry to influence the, your cardinal vowels. I'll show you what I have in mind. Wah, wah, wee, wee, wah. Wah, wah, wah. So once you get the pattern of the baby cry, go back and forth between the baby cry and a standard vowel. And when we're done, I want you to tell them what happened to your vowels. Wah. Wah, wah. You want? Um, wah, 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 we. I can't do it. <laughs> Did but, I do it? But you notice that the yes. E didn't match. E. Yes. It didn't follow the pattern. Hua, hua, hui, hua, hua, hui, 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 hui. Then back to wha. Hua, hua, hui, hui, hua, 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 Whoa, whoa. Wow. We're not done yet. Whoa. <laughs> I thought I was doing pretty good. Yeah, we're not done. we got one more valve. Oh, what do we got to do? Ooh. Oh. Wow. 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 Oh, I get it. A E I O U. Okay. White ball. <laughs> okay, so now you've got to let's do it again. Come on, I'm going to take it with the Wow. Now you got to tell us what happened to your vowels. They uh, they modulated some, didn't they? Yes, they mod they they modulated to uh, a nice pitch. They did. They had a different feeling to them, too, didn't they? They did. Would you describe the feelings or the sensations that you, you had when you went to those vowels? When I, went to, when I was doing the ha, huh, I could feel it a, a lot more down here in, in, the, in the diaphragm. But then when I went to the word, it, the word just came out naturally. And it, I didn't feel that, that hard pressure on the, on the diaphragm at that point. That's good. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Now, Jeanette and I were talking a little bit before we started because I was complimenting her on her, her uh, Swiss accent because her vowels were, uh, they were not constipated. <laughs> American, American vowels are very constricted vowels. They're formed at the back of the throat most. They're low in the pattern. They're low in the phoneme pattern, and they're dark in their, in their placement. Um, other languages, other, other cultures that hear English spoken don't hear the language with that, that we speak. When, they, when children try to imitate people who speak English, they say, this is the way, blah, 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 blah. That's what they hear when people speak English. That's because it's, uh, I guess I shouldn't say everybody hears that. I lived in Latin America, and when the little children would make fun of my speech, they would, that's how they would imitate the sounds that I was making. Uh, but um, Swiss German vowels are much different than, than our American vowels. And so what you were experiencing there without really saying so was that the vowels didn't sit in where they normally sit back in this range. They sort of sat up in the front of your face. They kind of tingled on the bridge of your nose and then your uh, cheekbones and things like that. And they did so. In the, in the process of doing so, they became more audible. And so some of the vowels, U vowels in particular, in American English, disappear. So you're singing, I love you. I love you. Ooh, 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 and there's no sound to it. But if you can get the vowels to behave and use the baby cry, I love you, and that you is just as audible as any of the other vowels there are, and it's made so because of the patterns inside your throat. And so one of the things that marks the difference between languages is the position of the tongue in your mouth. We're going to play a little game now to drive this point home. Cup your hands in a little megaphone. So you can see right here between, right there is the opening to the megaphone. And you're going to put it right into your front teeth. Okay. Now, I'm going to, the number one position goes from the tip of your nose to the edges of your corners of your pursed lips down to your chin. And it does not permit any vowel sounds inside your mouth. It's out in the front. And isn't it interesting that you can understand what I'm saying? Because, because I'm not speaking normal American vowels. They're, they're very different. Yes, it's very much Inspector Clouseau like. Very French like in a caricature kind of way. <laughs> All right, so I want you to count one, two, three, three, three. Okay, so now just to five, that's enough. So would you do it again and you'll discover that some of the vowels don't want to stay there very well. For example, you'll say one, two, three, four, five. Ooh, five doesn't want to be here because O wants to sit back in the back of your mouth. But you're going to keep it right up front. Will you do that? One, two, three, four, five. I've got to tell you, this is really a lot of fun. If you get a bunch of spread dance colors together for a party and you teach them this little game, <laughs> And, and we'll play the game here in just a minute. But that's the number one play. That's the one position, and nobody does that on purpose unless they're trying to be silly. Yeah. But the two is, is a sound that you, you'll hear sometimes, and it's across the bridge of the nose, down along the, the smile lines to the corners of the mouth, and it allows sounds at the eye teeth and to the alveolar ridge, but no deeper inside the mouth than that. Count to five. One, two... Three, four, five. Yeah, and that isn't quite normal for you, is it? Not that bad. No, it's not so terribly different. It's not, it's not difficult, no, but it's, it's not exactly home base, but it's close. That's right. And it's, it's about as foreign as it can be for an American. And so that's the two position. When you're looking to sing popular music, folk music, pop belt music, the singers will modulate their sound into that position. And if you're wanting to get a sound that's a little bit more brash or a little bit more rock and roll right, you move it into that place, and it'll take on that bright characteristic. Three goes from the corner of your eyes down across your mouth, and it allows sound back inside your mouth 
but to the edges of your molars, but not, not back on your molars. Okay, so it takes in the front half of your mouth. Count to five. One, two, three, four, five. Now, that probably feels almost exactly home base for you. It's not quite right for us, is it? We can do it, but it's not normal. Our, our, uh, the vowels sit in a somewhat, somewhat different position. The four position is right along, right at the, uh, the socket of the, of the jawbone, down along the jawbone, and it will take in vowel sounds back onto the molars. Count to five. One, two, three, four, five. And that feels like standard American English, doesn't it? That's normal for us. Uh, and, and five is as funny as one. It's the Forrest Gump voice where you have to kind of lose your IQ to be able to talk this way. Can you count to five this way? One, two, three, four, five. Now listen to the difference in the quality of the sound. This is going to be the very same pitch. I'm going to count to five. One, two, three, four, 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 five. It's exactly the same pitch. But it doesn't sound like it's the same pitch, does it? It changes the, co the, the timbre of the voice, the, the color of the voice, significantly. And my question to you is, how do you do that? How did I just do that? I can give you a hint. It isn't my hands. <laughs> the hands are simply an outside um, manifestation of something else that's going on. Anybody figure it out yet? Which of those? Nope. Yep. It is your tongue. It is the position of your tongue. Go to the number one position. Where is your tongue? It is so forward in front that no sound can get inside. Now go to the five. One, two, three, four, five. That's a kind of your turtle voice. And do you see where your tongue sits? Way back. And nothing else is different. The way that I phonate here, same raw sound. But it can be tuned this way. It can be tuned this way. It can be tuned this way. It can be tuned that way. It can be tuned this way. Just by the subtle movement of your tongue back and forth in your mouth. So here's the game. She'll be coming around the mountain. And I'm going to call different positions. Use your hands. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we're going to start in three. Put your hands up. Three, that's right. right. That's at the edge of your cheekbones. There's a more specific way to tell where that is. Put your finger right on your cheekbone, your zygomatic arch. Open your jaw, and you'll feel your jawbone emerge from, the, from underneath that hollow spot, right? The juncture of those two places, that's the third position. So it's almost equal to the edges of your eye sockets, but it allows sound to creep into your mouth, but only as deep to the edges of the molars, but not onto the molars. Okay? She'll... You ready? Three. Go. She'll be coming... Two. She'll be coming round... Four. Five. One. And this gets to be really fun. It's, 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 it's particularly fun if you get a church group together singing a sacred hymn. <laughs> and, and they're going along, and four sounds so reverential, and three sounds okay, and so, two sounds irreverent, and, and one sounds sacrilegious. You know? <laughs> it just, yeah, the, the, it's like when you get into a, a one, it's uh, like listening to a kazoo choir. It's really a fun game. And what's so funny about it, like all of the other techniques that we've talked about, is that it's easy to do. It's easy to drive the point home. So we talked about louds and softs as being one of the ways that you can change the quality of the voice. But the, the forwardness or backness of your tongue has a, a great bearing on that as well. So Jeanette is just puzzling away because we were talking about the difference between uh, languages and where languages sit with their, their vowels, and they sit there in those positions because the tongue is trained 
uh, inherently to do that way, not because somebody went and pegged it to the floor, but because they just we follow patterns of that which we've been surrounded by, and we adopt those sounds. Right now, I'm speaking to you in English, but I'm speaking to you with European vowels. Can you hear the difference? Can you hear that this is English, but this doesn't sound like normal conversational English. This sounds a little studied, doesn't it? A little too educated. And this sounds really normal. And all I did was change the position of my tongue. You do. That's right. As if, as if you would want to do that. <laughs> but uh, we, were, we were talking now about ways that you change tone qualities. You're smart people. You know that if you're going to call a good dance, you're going to have a variety of singing tips through the evening that are going to elicit different kinds of moods. Some will be up and fun. Some will be earnest and, and some will be tender and some of them will be comical and whimsical. And if you sing them with a standard singing voice, you'll lose so much of what could be available to you. The exploration of, of coloration of voice is a wonderful thing, which you can help your, your, your callers to learn to do from the very beginning. I want to summarize now. I, I think we're close to the end of our time, are we not? Okay, so to summarize for you, the first thing that you want to try to do is to establish healthy sound production. That can be done most of the time by finding a way to increase, increase breath movement. For most people, it's an uh, issue of breath movement. Um, that can be done by using a straw. It can be done by using the pinwheel image. It can be done by uh, unvoiced consonants, fricatives like Fs or Vs, F, V, V, or sh, j, j, so progressively you go from a voiceless to a voiced to the, the consonant out of the way and the vowel in its wake. Uh, that's another way that you can find that efficient pattern. And then you just get the people to do it enough times so that it starts to take hold um, in their minds. If you never get any farther than that, you will have done them a great service. The next thing you want to do is to give them permission and help them have tools to be able to inflect their pitch upwards and downwards. And we saw that the straw can help because the more the air flows, the less the vocal folds stiffen. We acknowledge that there is a shifting of gears in the voice that can be un unstabilizing and intimidating to people. That if you keep the air flowing, they will, those patterns will shift more readily than if, there's, if there, the air is not flowing. We also looked at the baby cry as a pattern of sound production that includes a placement paradigm, a lifted soft palate, a released throat, and a spontaneous breath. I really like that pattern because it's so holistic, and you don't have to teach it. You just have to encourage people to do what they've, they used to be able to do. So it's a, it's a self-fulfilling kind of way to uh, do that. The baby cry will help in healthy sound production. It will also help in peak and pitch inflection. Louds and softs. We did that with percentages of energy, getting somebody in balance and then having them sing at their fullest and their quietest and, and measuring the distance between, but always within the parameters of what they could accomplish. Truly, it doesn't matter if their distance of loud to soft is narrow. They can still calibrate it within that boundary and then push the boundaries outwards. And the last one is all was the qualitative one, and the qualitative one had to do with uh, the baby cry to try to establish new patterns of vowels, we played front and back games to, to show that that also influenced and that loud and soft also influenced quality. Um, Jerry, before, um, before we broke for lunch, wanted me to mention just one other thing, and that is that it's one thing to sing. It's another thing to talk, and it's not unusual for square dance callers to talk a lot. Teachers talk a lot all day. And so some of the patterns that we've talked about for singing – are no different from the patterns of speaking. If, you're vo if you use a flowing phonation, your voice will not tire. If you don't use a flowing phonation, if their air isn't flowing, you hear what happened to the quality of my voice, you hear the gravel that comes into it. That gravelly quality is a dead giveaway that there isn't sufficient air flowing to hit the Bernoulli, that efficiency place. The, second, the last thing having to do with speech is something that I call primal sound. It's the sound, again, that a child makes in its infancy, 
and that some adults continue to play with uh, into their adulthood. That sound, uh, barkers on the carousel use this sound. People that sell newspapers use this sound. It is this kind of quality of sound, and that sound is a little brash, but it has no pressure associated with it. There's no strain in the throat when you do that. If you capture that primal quality, you can speak for extended periods of time without weariness to your voice and without strain. Um, and in, in it, um, it requires just a simple adjustment of your expectations. That's all I had in mind to talk about. If you have any other questions, you come forward and we can chat for a minute. Otherwise, it's been great to work with you. Thanks. Thank you.